workshops and webinars over the years for, for athletes and, and staff at the Canadian Institute of Sport and absolutely love the way that they approach sport, athletes, business and for purpose causes. Former Olympian and bronze medalist Tom Hall heads up the game plan program at the Canadian Olympic, uh, Olympic Committee. Tom has worked for more than a decade, uh, both as a volunteer and as a leader for athlete focused organizations and to make the national team athlete journey as safe, fair and healthy as possible in Canada. He believes that sport by developing Canada's leading uh, leaders of tomorrow has a potential to make Canada better. But that can only happen when we focus on the whole athlete, not just the outcomes. As national manager of Game Plan, Canada's total athlete wellness program, he gets to translate that belief into action. Tom joins the Echo Think Tank to share his insights and perspective on how amateur sport can survive and thrive during this crisis. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Excellent. So, um, as I said, you, you'll be bringing us a pr uh, perspective from, uh, from the amateur sport. And, uh, and I guess for me, um, as, a, as a professional athlete, but, uh, but also a coach, uh, my, my heart and my passion lies on, on, bo on both sides of the fence, I guess. And, um, yeah, amateur sport in particular and, and that grassroots is, uh, yeah, moving forward is uh, yeah, really, really important to, to getting sport back up and, and running again. Uh, around the world. So as with all of our other speakers, uh, I've got a few, few questions to, uh, to ask you and we'll, we'll jump straight in. So um, in the, the view of amateur sport, what, are you, what do you see the current um, issues or, or challenges that, that amateur sport's facing at the moment? Yeah, so um, I think the, the best way to illustrate that is, is to describe what I do for a living. And, and uh, the, the program that I manage and the team that I manage, Game Plan, is, its mission is to mitigate uncertainty for athletes, essentially. And, and um, so we're this collaborative initiative from a bunch of organizations, the Olympic Committee, the Paralympic Committee, the federal government, and, and the institute, the network of institutes across Canada, the sport institutes across Canada. And we help athletes with like education and career and planning for life after sport to help them um, be able to focus more on their sport and, and really excel on and off the field of play, right? So that's, that's a bit of our boilerplate language. But I think it's, it's important because the, the, the number one thing we're seeing is that uncertainty is, is the biggest issue. And a couple of the speakers have already spoken about it today. And, um, you know, just an example of the level of, I guess, uh, concern that's out there is our... Um, outreach to athletes or athletes outreach to us, pardon me, has gone up by about 300% in the past uh, three months. And so athletes are, are recognizing that they, they um, need to figure out what's next, uh, regardless of what happens with the games next summer. And, uh, and, and so they're turning to us for support. So it is really an interesting conversation with them. Um, most of them are very focused on being the best they can be in their sport, but just recognize that they might as well make the best of this difficult situation. And I think a few of your speakers have spoken about uh, some of the leadership that Canadian athletes have shown. And it is really interesting because there's a great deal of frustration amongst the athletes. They want to get back to their sport. They want to get training. They want to know what's next. And not only them, but our high performance leaders um, will, will say the exact same things. When can I get back to working with my athletes? Um, but it, by this, uh, on the other side of the coin or the, is, is that those athletes and those people realize that um, by pushing pause on, on the most important thing in their lives, which is the Olympics and preparation for the Olympics, um, they are helping their community and their families and, and really their country and, and frankly, the rest of the world by putting those dreams on hold. And so it's this really interesting time in amateur sport, at least in Canada, where people have kind of accepted that um, they need to wait and they're trying their best to be patient, but it's not very easy. And, uh, and I think they're getting ready or the, they're anxious to get started again, but only when it's safe to do so. Yeah, definitely. And it's, um, it's interesting seeing, uh, I guess, you know, a lot of athletes on, on social media are, are posting and sharing different ways of, of how they're working through, uh, you know, this current situation and, and being adaptive and adapting their, their training and, and the way they're sort of working towards, still working towards their goals, but just, you know, with a slightly different um, you know, path around it. 
Well, exactly. I mean, you know, early in, in the early time, this is early times, <laughs> back in March, which seems like a lifetime ago, uh, you know, it, it, two weeks into kind of the physical distancing, some, I saw an athlete post that this is the longest they'd been out of a pool since they were about six years old, you know. So, you know, when you frame it like that, it's actually extremely profound for young people, I think, and, and the athletes we work with. But uh, on the whole, they're being incredibly resilient. I think it's, so. The uncertainty is an issue, and obviously, uh, on a on a on an individual level, we are concerned around things like mental health. And so, we've invested a bunch of time and resources ensuring that athletes have access to that and other people in the system as well, um, because yeah, it's difficult for everybody. Yeah, definitely, and I, and I think that sort of leads us um, well into into our, our next question. And um, I, I guess you. Know, Looking at it more positively now, um, what are the current opportunities that, that you see for, you know, for amateur sport and, and amateur athletes? Yeah, and, and I think this is where it gets super interesting. Um, a, a few of your speakers, and Brian Lewis earlier today spoke about it, and I, he essentially said, don't waste the opportunity to reflect um, and, and you know, what, is a, what is important and what is essential all of a sudden. And I think that question is long overdue. Uh, the the idea that the essential workers are some of the workers that got the least respect um, a little while ago, a, a few short months ago, I think is absolutely crucial and something that I just I hope we we don't lose sight of. Uh, in Canada, you know, the 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 biggest example has probably been um, the 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 long term care facilities for our elderly people and just kind of the what's going on there and and. So the idea that COVID has shone a light on a bunch of these areas is, is super important. And I think it's done the same thing with sport. And, and so I, there's a quote that I keep in the front of my mind all the time from, uh, I think it's Carlo Ancelotti, the football coach, who talks about, and, and it's an Italian saying about football, like there's something along the lines of, it's the most important of the less important thing. And so we've, we've realized that, you know, we can put, the Stanley Cup playoffs on hold. We can put the Olympics on hold for a year. We can, we can push pause on these things. Um, and so in, in that respect, it's not as essential as other things in our, in our society. But when I walk my dog around my neighborhood, which is, you know, it's a middle-class neighborhood and, and truly in the middle of everything. So we have some million dollar homes not too far away. And then all my back neighbors are subsidized housing. So low income housing here in Canada. And I walk my dogs by a park and there are 30 kids playing in that park every day. And so I think about grassroots sports and I think, well, nothing has stopped. And uh, at, the, at the fundamental level, the kids that need to get out, that don't have a nice yard, that don't have a lot of room to play in are out playing. And so as, a, as an amateur sports system, you know, how can we be sure that uh, when we come out of this, we are um, effectively you know, helping those kids and, and not only uh, working at, at, at the purely elite level of, of kind of amateur sports. And, um, and I also think it's crucial that we think about that in terms of the resiliency of our sports system, because if we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars a year into, into something that, that has a big question mark after it now, because we truly don't know what's going to come next and, and when normal, whatever that is, will we'll resume. Um, I think we need to really focus on building the most resilient system we can. And that resilient system has, has a real uh, broad focus in terms of the entire sport pyramid from the playground all the way to the podium at the top. And, you know, we do that in Canada already. I just think it's a shift of focus and a shift of measuring what, what values we have. And I think that's the same conversation that's happening in, in business and, and the rest of society. What do we value? What's truly important? And um, what are the kind of no-brainer win-win situations when we come out of this? And for me, it's helping these kids that, that I live around um, have safe and, and um, fun access to sport, I think is huge. Yeah, definitely. And, and one of the things that um, we're noticing through our work uh, with sports organizations uh, in that, uh, I guess, that have a lot of clubs and, and amateur clubs and grassroots clubs attached to them, um, yeah, we're losing a, or a lot of those clubs have shut down and are, are worrying about whether they're going to reopen and, and how they're going to reopen. What are you, what are you kind of seeing as current opportunities at a grassroots level for, for say a club like that to, uh, to come out the other side of this and, and continue 
uh, I guess, along that, what we're calling the, the new normal. Yeah, and, and I think that's an excellent point. So, you know, the, the Olympics get put on hold and then all of a sudden um, some major events, so some major sports in Canada lost millions of dollars when they had to cancel or postpone events. Uh, so the Rogers Cup tennis matches uh, have been postponed a year, um, but I think figure skating Canada lost millions when they had to cancel their world championships, right? And so those sports, they invest that money in the grassroots as much as they can in their clubs and in developing their sport. And, and not only that, but those club sports. And so my sport of canoe kayak is club-based. Um, there is no summer program right now. Uh, you, you can't get a bunch of kids. And, and canoeing is actually one of the ones where you might be able to. But you certainly can't get a bunch of kids um, playing rugby uh, right away this summer. Like, that's just not going to happen anytime soon, at least full contact. And, uh, and so it's very difficult if you have a club that charges membership fees and exists on membership fees, if you can't charge memberships for anything. And not mm. only that, but a million Canadians lost their jobs in March. And I'm sure the numbers for April will be equally dire. And so who can afford to pay the membership fees for swim clubs or soccer clubs or canoe clubs? And, and so it's really interesting. The, the federal government has just come out with 72 million to invest in sport and to help everything from our uh, high performance national sport organizations to our grassroots clubs. But I do think there's going to be a real interesting, um, I, I don't know, uh, out, you know, shakeout, I guess, in the next couple months or years. And one thing that, that I think is a, a really interesting opportunity in terms of win-wins is when you look at education and the move to online education, uh, and everyone is aware that if you are teaching people something, you better be able to do it uh, via Zoom like we're doing tonight because uh, people are getting used to this and there are some serious benefits and cost savings. Um, you know, what are the same, what are the equivalent win-wins for sport? And so I, I'll take canoe kayak because I know this sport very well and I did it for 30 years. Um, it is a sport that uh, to get at a high level at, you have to have a certain amount of money. It's not the most expensive sport, but you certainly have to be firmly in the middle class. You have to have parents that can drive you to practice early in the morning and pick you up. Um, and you also have to have a flexible enough schedule where you can train all that time. Not only that, you have to know how to swim. You have to be able to get on the water. And so I think what do parents need? What are parents going to need in August or September if, if the world opens up in some way again? And what can a canoe club do for them? Again, assuming that people have lost jobs and can't afford the membership fees as normal, you know, if there was a way that the local canoe club here that's only a couple kilometers away could get a bus, drive it into the community, pick up a bunch of kids at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., take them to the canoe club, teach them how to swim, teach them water safety in a safe, controlled environment and keep them busy and doing constructive things and then bring them home at four or five and, and feed them a meal in the middle of it. Like, obviously, this is idealism in the extreme, but if that could happen, you get kids doing something that's great and active and you get parents um, who finally get a break from their kids. And not only that, maybe have a chance to go and, and, uh, and try to get some work again in a difficult time. So, you know, I think we're going to have to look at what do we need to do to make that happen? And again, I'll just to emphasize the fact that sport hasn't stopped. The sport we know and love has stopped, but sport um, in its most traditional form is happening every day. Um, and, and I think we need to figure out how to make that as safe as possible for you. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it comes back down to movement, doesn't it? And, and, you know, the ability to still get out and exercise and, and kick a football or, or, you know, have a run around the, run around the park. Um, yeah, there's always opportunities out there to, to at least stay active and, and staying moving, even though, uh, you know, the, that particular sport that you might participate in isn't currently available. And, and I think, you know, you, you made a good point about um, so it's engaging the parents um, and, and also freeing up the parents' time um, <laughs> as well. I know, you know, there's obviously here in Australia, a lot of, a lot of parents are homeschooling at the moment and, uh, and pulling their hair out and, and having a newfound appreciation for, uh, for how much teachers actually um, put up with. So um, I think, you know, from a, from a at, at grassroots or that amateur sports club uh, level, do you think that finding a way to also engage the parents as well? So meanwhile, as, you know, as much as the kids want, need to get back into sport and want to get back into sport, and there is that, uh, I guess, you know, financial barrier with families that, that may be out of work or on a reduced income, do you think there's an opportunity there for clubs to, to look at engaging the parents 
better as well. Definitely. And, 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 and I think this is something, um, so I, I use this canoe kayak example that's, that's fairly extreme, right? That does cost a lot of money. But hey, if you're not flying, you know, if you're not flying a whole bunch or sending a, a bunch of kids across the country in Canada, well, like Australia, is large, um, you know, you have some cost savings. So maybe there is a way to do it. But that aside, um, football um, or soccer here in Canada, let's get every kid a soccer ball who wants one. And then let's do some, some uh, super basic coaching education via Zoom uh, for free for parents. And, uh, you know, how to, how to teach your kids the four basic drills, whatever it is, whatever the basic rules are, or better and better yet, get, get one of the superstars to, to host that from their living room how to play, you know, how to do football dr drills safely in your living room or, uh, you know, something along those lines, I think would be super cool. And, and again, a way to get people moving and active because I do think that the sport we're talking about, the amateur grassroots sport is really one of the important things and, and will be seen as such purely for the health reasons. Um, you know, that, that getting people moving, getting people active in a constructive way and, and also the community level sport is super important. And so, yes, getting the parents active and engaged is going to be super important. And so if another example, if we're not going to be able to fill a hockey stadium with 20,000 people to watch the Stanley Cup playoffs or something like that, or, or host a big national championships where people are flying across Canada to come together for an event, can we host a community event? So here at my park, everyone within walking distance is invited to a community sporting event. So yeah, we're still getting a lot of people together and it would depend on all the physical distancing rules but at least no one's traveling. And if an outbreak were to occur again, you'd, you'd know that they're within this radius where they're easy to track. And so maybe that's a, a you know, a, a funded by the sport, but community run organization with one or two outside experts brought in to support that kind of thing. You know, I think we're really gonna have to start thinking about this stuff and, and ways to engage at a community level um, people and getting them active. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, how, how sports and how clubs adapt and, and, you know, obviously we've adapted to you know, these changes now, but how much of that they carry forward, uh, yeah, into, into the future. And, you know, obviously it, it has the potential to be profitable for them, uh, but how they, they look to you know, take it from this, this initial concept and, and adapting to the crisis to, to now going, Hey, we can, we can monetize this. So, you know, we can create a, a bigger opportunity amongst it. And I, I guess finally, um, what for yourself personally, what, uh, what opportunities have you found or, or, you know, what have you created for yourself, uh, you know, through this time? So there's, there's a great irony here. And, and when I saw this question, I, I, uh, I work on a program that champions a balance in life and, and it's a program that got uh, an increase of 300%. And so I have not had uh, a moment to myself really in the past uh, couple months. Um, it has been, uh, we've been tremendously busy, but it's been also super exciting. And, and so I guess my personal, you know, the, the personal things that have opened up for me are an awareness of, capacity to, to work overtime, but also learning my limitations pretty quickly. Um, but I, I also just think that the power of doing the things that feels that feel right. And, you know, that is building communities of support for um, our athletes and our coaches and, and the people that uh, we support or try to support has been really special and really meaningful. And, and hearing from athletes has also been really nice. So like, one of the things that we've started recently are these athlete co-op calls. So these are for your Olympic and Paralympic athlete level people uh, or athletes. And um, it's just a chance for them to get together and, and support each other, right? And be together far apart. And, you know, what comes out on those calls is super powerful. And, and um, the idea that everyone has the shared experience, even though one might be a rower and the other one might be a snowboarder and they live totally different <laughs> worlds and different seasons, but um, you know, they have this shared experience through COVID and, and the shared frustrations, but realizations about what's key and what's important and what isn't is all really powerful. So I think for me, you know, I'm hopeful, hopefully going to get a week off soon. And it is a long weekend this weekend in, in Canada. And um, 
you know, it's just going to be a chance to get outside now that it's spring here and take a deep breath and, um, and reflect on what has been a very uh, wild couple months. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so I, I know I, I should have a good answer to this. I should be talking about my yoga or something, but honestly, it's been, uh, we've been going full tilt for a while. Yeah, definitely. It, it's interesting. I, I've been, yeah, I, I've tried to stay positive, um, as positive as possible this, this whole crisis. And yeah, I think on reflection, um, I think a lot of people get to spend, yeah, obviously your, your workload's increased, but, um, but for a lot of people that, that where so many people are working, you know, 40, 50, 60 plus hours, um, and, you know, there's this new normal or this expectation that we're, we're online and we're, we're contactable 24-7, um, that people are starting to put their phones down and, and shut the laptop and, you know, spending more time with, with their family and, and not so much their friends um, as the restrictions have got, got tighter. But, yeah, we've, we've been able to reflect and a lot of our other speakers have spoken about that today as well in that, um, you yeah, just that, that little bit of self-reflection and that time to, to reassess what's important to you and, and what, what you prioritize in life. And, uh, you yeah, I know for me personally, that's, that's something that I've been able to do and, and thoroughly enjoyed having uh, a few weeks at home uh, while, while the golf courses were closed. Uh, yeah, to spend a, a little bit more time with uh, with my wife and, and our young child, but um, uh, I've got a few more gray hairs from it as well. But that, that's the that's the trade off. I, I should add very quickly. Yeah, I, so generally, I, I, it's a nationwide program, right? And we have people from Halifax to Victoria, and so I did spend a lot of time on a plane. And so I'm incredibly fortunate that I have a relatively nice house, and uh, and I'm home, and I have a home office that I can work in. And my biggest hardship truly has been not being able to see my parents and my brother and sister that live only two hours away, but in a different province. And I just, you know, I can't see them yet. And so that's been my biggest hardship. But it has been nice in terms of your right, looking at what, what you value. I love my job and it's incredibly fun that it's been good. But this backdrop I use in Zoom calls is, is from an area about four hours north of where I am. And I took this photo on an October morning about four years ago or three years ago. And that is where I want to be in October. And I, you know, I have my eye, my eye set on the prize um, when, when I can finally uh, get out and travel again and, and um, get a break. You know, I, it's, it's certainly there. Yeah, for sure. And I think that is the silver lining of all of this for those of us who are lucky enough to experience it is um, a chance to be, you know, uh, thinking about what's important again. And, and yeah, without a doubt that's that's a special a special thing definitely excellent well thanks tom that uh, will that kind of leads us right up bang on uh, on your time so thank you very much for for joining us and, and providing your insights it's uh, it's been great chatting with you and uh, and appreciate you sharing your time you. and uh stay safe <laughs> yeah likewise we'll see you soon thank you yeah.